The gifts deposited at the Temple of Diana span the full range, from the elaborately expensive to the cheap and mundane. It seems that the temple attracted a wide public and that each worshipper brought to the temple what they could afford. Now Caterina Lorenz turns her attention to a small, apparently insignificant fragment, which may give us important clues about the fabric of Roman society at the time. What we see here in front of us is the upper part of a, of a little terracotta oil lamp, not much bigger than the palm of a hand, I suppose. And oil lamps are a very, very widespread object, obviously, in the ancient world. Much easier to handle than a candle because you don't have to worry about the wax and you just fill the oil inside the, the little kind of, it's a bit like a little kind of teapot, I suppose. And then you burn it and you can carry it around with you. So a very, very handy, very safe way of, of, of lighting a room. What's striking about this oil lamp is its decoration. Now this particular lamp is interesting because it is decorated on the top, as are many lamps, but whereas quite a few oil lamps, because it's a, it's a cheap product, it's, it's something a lot of people have, they just have very generic types of decoration. Here actually we have a very interesting little scene depicted, and a scene depicting a figure, a man, and that's quite unusual already. And what makes it even more unusual is that this man is, is accompanied by a monkey, the man sits on the on the ground and, and the monkey sits next to him, so they're kind of in, in communication. And then looking um, on the right, away from the two, well, we see a little ladder and, and a cat climbs the ladder. And um, just, just above the heads of the man and the cat, we, we see two rings. And this, this gives us some clues that this is probably a scene of, of, of a street artist, a street um, entertainer, who, who had animals trained to, to, to perform little tricks, who would also juggle with the rings and, and, and do some, some entertainment himself. He has some bread with him, so probably his lunch, and also a little bowl to, well, I suppose to collect money. Perhaps it's his, his drink, but he might just also use it to collect money. So it's a kind of a, a very mundane scene, a kind of a genre scene almost, but a very good little snapshot of urban um, and Roman life, I suppose. And Caterina Lorenz believes the depiction of this everyday scene has a lot to tell us about both the donor of the object and the society in which it was made. One of the, the ways to explain this is perhaps that this was either dedicated or owned by someone who also was, was a part of this class, who also was perhaps one of these kind of street entertainers who identified with that and who used such a scene in order to make a kind of a fairly proud statement actually about his trade. And we do have lots of instances in, in Roman society, especially in the period of the late Republican and early imperial period, which is the peak period of the sanctuary in Nemi, in interest of the lower classes, um, not just the upper classes, but also the lower classes, of depicting what they're actually doing. Now, they are not generals and they don't, they don't run the magistrate or anything, they don't give speeches, but we have lots of depictions, primarily from the funerary context, where slaves or kind of people who made some money, Roman freedmen, would depict themselves very proudly doing their trades bakers, for instance, or all sorts of uh, workmen. And perhaps this little kind of depiction on the lamp is something which is a depiction which actually makes a proud statement about the, the trade of an entertainer, which, as I said, is, is a very low-class pursuit. At the very bottom of the social heap were slaves, and there's strong evidence that the slaves worshipped at the temple alongside people from every other social class. There may even be a particular link between the cult of Diana and slavery. In an influential folk tradition, the chief priest of the temple was described as an ex-slave who had escaped from his master. In order to achieve the elevated position of chief priest at the Temple of Diana, he had to fight a duel with and kill the current incumbent. Whether this is historical fact is open to question, but it does cast an interesting light on perceptions of social mobility at the time. The interesting thing is Nemi is also a good side to demonstrate to us that this mobility, this flexibility in the Roman society was a reality and that there were people, even though, despite being slaves, they were able to uh, fulfil very important functions. And we have documentation from, from Roman culture in general that slaves did act as, as proper businessmen. Sometimes they made so much money they were able to buy themselves out of slavery. This might shed some light on some of the consumers of myth at the time the temple was in its heyday. For the lower classes, and slaves in particular, going to a sanctuary like this one may have had a reassuringly empowering psychological effect. 
They couldn't make their mark politically, but there were places like, for instance, sanctuaries where they were able to make their mark by means of, of visual representation. And it may well be that the person who donated the oil lamp could have been in this position. In the next section, we'll meet another ex-slave with links to the temple and follow the evidence about his life and career. 